The Kimberley is a huge wilderness in the far north of Western Australia, where dangerous waters churned by savage tides protect a coastline so rugged that only experienced seamen with sound local knowledge ply the Kimberley coast. Adventurer, filmmaker Malcolm Douglas has spent the last 30 years exploring this remote region, battling the elements in small boats, catching fish for a feed, and camping for weeks on sandy beaches and small rocky islands. There's now worldwide interest in the Kimberley and enormous pressure for large-scale development along the pristine coastline. Malcolm's so concerned that he's supporting a new concept. A 34-metre vessel, the True North, is custom-built to explore these northern shores. This low-impact tourism will help protect the Kimberley from over-exploitation. The True North has berthed in Broome, and Malcolm joins the boat on her maiden voyage. It's late March, the end of the wet season, and with a Jet Ranger helicopter to film Australia's hidden waterfalls, it's going to be a journey packed with excitement and adventure. The True North will travel around the Kimberley coast from Broome, arriving two weeks later in Wyndham. Owner skipper Craig Howson knows the Kimberley well and designed True North for the journey ahead. After a 12-hour overnight run, they travel through the Buccaneer Archipelago, heading for Talbot Bay. With 28 passengers on board, the chef will be busy. First stop is the incredible horizontal waterfalls of Talbot Bay. This tidal rush has become one of the Kimberley's great tourist attractions. The huge tide pushes in from the Indian Ocean through narrowing bays until it funnels into the last gap, barely 30 metres wide. The 11 metre rise and fall makes this one of the most extreme tidal ranges in the world. Within a few hours, at the turn of the tide, all this water will funnel out again. An hour later, the runabouts head up Silver Gull Creek to visit Phil and Marion, two beachcombers who arrived in the Kimberley years ago on a yacht and built a camp high among the rocks. They're sociable people and Marion's delighted with her bottle of port from the crew. They make a few dollars selling pearl shell jewellery and Malcolm's already bartering with Phil. Marion's enjoying the company and as she pours another drink, explains how they cope with the isolation. During the wet season, they might not have visitors for months. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Everyone's invited down to the pool for a dip. Years ago, a mining company built a cement tank here to collect spring water. It's now Phil and Marion's water supply and swimming pool. There is four tanks, and Cockatoo Island and Coolin Island used to barge all the water from here until they put down their own, what do they call those things? Bores. Bores. And they used to barge all their water. And right up the end, we found the original old uh, tank. And what did you do? You've turned it into a swimming pool for tourists and visitors and... No, what we did was it was so hot here that we cut a window in it, cleaned out all the shit and diverted the water here. Well, now we've got a swimming pool. You want a chair? With chairs and shade and a cool drink, there's no better place on a hot day. And 
light. We are in the swimming pool having a small party. Donated by Craig. So nicely. And how's the water? The water is body temperature. It comes straight out of the ground. It comes straight from the sump into the pool and out here. And we're making a waterfall. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so I had to go in there for get out of this place. <laughs> With the late afternoon sun rapidly disappearing, the visit's over. Phil and Marion will amuse themselves and make pearl shell jewellery until the next visit, when the True North arrives with more customers and another bottle of port. TV in Germany. The chest out cuts in, Mary, and that's <laughs> Many of the Kimberley's bays and inlets are still uncharted. Craig, with years of experience, takes the true north into the most extraordinary locations. Next stop's Montgomery Reef, 10 kilometres from the mainland. This huge expanse of rock and coral is inundated at high tide. And when the tide ebbs, billions of litres of water runs off again. A deep, narrow channel dissects the reef, so the true north navigates right into the centre where the passengers can view the spectacle at low tide. And fish are on the bite along the edge of the cascades. Late in the afternoon, it's time to leave this amazing place and head for Raft Point on the mainland. In a few hours, the reef will again be deep underwater. wet season storm lingers in the west. With the movement of the massive tide and the protection of hundreds of islands, there's no ocean swell in the archipelago, so travelling is calm and tranquil. This is Barramundi country. Everyone's keen to flick a lure and True North has a stock of hundreds. The distinguishing feature of Doubtful Bay is a massive outcrop of Kimberley sandstone. It's a special place. Until recently, an overhanging rock at the top was a base for the local Aborigines. They left on the walls of the cave images of their creator, the Wanjana. For the passengers, it's a chance to visit a historical site, but for Malcolm, the experience is far more emotional. When Malcolm camped near here in 1976, his old tribal friend, Wulagudja, first showed him this cave. These are the Wanjana, mythical dreamtime beings, creators and guardians of this section of coastline. All the West Kimberley tribes had caves where their Wanjana left images. The Wawara tribe called this place Namalali. Until recently, tribesmen repainted the Wanjana to appease the spirits. But today their people have gone and the Wanjana are slowly fading. Old Wulagudja, a powerful tribal elder, told the Wanjana stories to Malcolm as he repainted one of the images for the last time. Shortly after this journey with Malcolm, Wulagudja died. 
He was the last coastal tribesman to restore his Wanjana. There's always something to do. Before True North heads for Ruby Falls at the southern end of Doubtful Bay, some of the passengers get an overview of the high escarpment from the Jet Ranger. It's a 15 minute run up the mangrove lime creek into a small rocky gorge. Only metres above the tidal influence, Ruby Falls. Beautiful place, somewhere to relax where there are no dangerous saltwater crocodiles. As the tide ebbs, they move on before the dinghies are stranded on the rocks. It's over 30 years since crocodiles were protected in Western Australia and their numbers are slowly increasing. Rock spotting is always a popular activity. In the tallest mangroves, little red flying foxes have been roosting during the day. They're disturbed by the passing boats, and the males are particularly agitated. They defend their roosting area viciously. The victor settles to rest until nightfall. Saltwater crocodiles are never far away from flying fox colonies. Here, the big reptiles lie in wait for the very young and the weak and feeble to drop into the water. Whenever True North stops for a few hours, the keen anglers are out in the dinghies. Kimberley rivers are full of surprises. This huge mackerel will feed everyone on board. in the mouth of the Sail River, and there's movement at the stern. An inquisitive crocodile investigates the dinghies, swims around the boat, and disappears. At low tide, it's time for some serious barra fishing along the edge of the mud flats. Within minutes, Malcolm's hooked a nice fish. Everyone wants to land a barramundi, and fortunately, in the warmer months after the monsoons, they're usually on the bite. On the rising tide, it's a long run to the top of the Sail River. This unique place are rugged gorges and cascading waterfalls. And here, where the tidal influence meets the fresh water, a dense pocket of rainforest thrives. So unexpected after the barren, rocky Kimberley escarpments. After a walk in the lush jungle and a swim, everyone gathers for a gourmet lunch. Then it's back to the boat for the overnight run north to Camden Harbour.
early in the morning, at low tide, everyone's ashore scouting among the rocks for huge Kimberley oysters. Gonna have a look up the homestead site. Within 30 minutes, two big buckets are full. And as a late season storm builds, it's back on board. After sundown, the oysters are sizzling on the barbecue. Not a bad way to end the day. Before the main evening meal, it's decided to spotlight for crocodiles in a nearby creek. This is a highlight for the passengers. And they're lucky to see a croc grab and swallow a mullet. Because he's a dominant predator, he's a key species in the river system. Take out the crocs, of course, and upsets the balance. Malcolm, with a lifetime of crocodile experience, is never short of a story. This hatchling, only a few weeks old, will be lucky to survive. Only one in a hundred reach maturity in the wild. So to identify the sex of that crop, you'd have to roll him over and you'd have to put him under a microscope. In 50 years, this croc, only centimetres long, could grow to five metres and weigh over 500 kilos. This activity attracts a larger croc and it silently circles the dinghy. The next day, True North is 30 nautical miles up the Prince Regent River. An abundance of fresh water cascades from the ridges. And here at Camp Creek, there's usually good-sized barra. A short, steep walk into the escarpment reveals a magical place. High on a cliff, a perfect swimming hole. This country with its strong light, rich colours and extraordinary shapes is a photographer's dream. Late in the day, the jet ranger arrives to ferry everyone back on board. After anchoring for the night, True North heads further up the mighty Prince Regent River. <laughs> Craig's able to manoeuvre right up to the King's Cascades. A truly amazing sight and one of the many highlights of the two-week journey. The navigator, Philip Parker King, on an exploratory trip around the Kimberley coast, discovered these falls in 1820. Few people had ever heard of the King's Cascades until the 29th of March 1987, when a yacht anchored midstream and as the crew swam beneath the falls, an American, Ginger Meadows, was taken by a huge saltwater crocodile.
Back in 1971, when Malcolm and his mates were travelling on the streeter, an old broom purling lugger, they tied up beside these cascades to replenish their water supply at the end of the long dry season. Times have changed. Now world travellers can see the falls from a luxury boat. Or look down on the cascades from a helicopter. There's little water below the falls at low tide, so as the tide turns, the True North must head downriver and out into the open sea to continue her journey along the coast. The weather's now settling after the monsoons. The dry season's beginning, and ahead are months of warm, pleasant days and cool nights. <laughs> North of the Prince Regent, a night excursion reveals a significant historical marker. In 1820, King careened his sloop, the Mermaid, in the small tidal creek near here, and the crew left their mark on this ancient boab. The tree's estimated to be 400 years old. Dawn finds True North at anchor in the tranquil waters of the Hunter, one of the most remote rivers in Australia. All day is spent exploring the river and its tributaries. The pristine wilderness offers photographers, bird watchers and naturalists so much. At low tide, the muddy banks are teeming with life. Long-eyed crabs and erratic mudskippers are busy feeding for an hour or two while the banks are exposed. Mudskippers, amphibious air breathers, drown if they stay too long underwater. To absorb oxygen from the air, they scuttle to the water's edge and moisten their gills. Malcolm's after succulent mud crabs. The True North chef's preparing a special seafood treat and has put in an order. Back on board, Malcolm demonstrates the art of tying mud crabs. He explains how it's done. Stops to answer questions and the crab locks onto his finger. A slow motion replay shows the bite in agonizing detail.
next day, the crab's on the table. And what a spread. With 38 people on board, fresh fish is a major part of the menu, and soon everyone's off in the dinghies to stock the freezers again. Oh, Valerie's got one, look. Late afternoon is the best time to fish. Mangrove Jack and Finger Mark are usually oh, on the bite. Oh, look at that one. That's a fish and a half. Everyone catches fish. And at last, Jan, the fanatical fisherwoman, is happy. After days of sunshine and sea breezes, the weather report predicts a cyclonic low off the North Australian coast. The calm sea allows a stopover on Biggie Island. Above the beach, fascinating rock art is protected by an overhang. This is a well-preserved painting of a Kayara. Like Wanjana, Kayara are spirits that control the wind, rain and lightning. The Kayara originally arrived by sea, carried onto the coast by cyclones. Sadly, the Aborigines whose spirits came from the Kayara are now dead. Only their bones remain in rock crevices on the island. Behind the Kayara, a maze of caves provides shelter for small animals, especially during the long, cooler months of the dry season. Nearby, under a low rock ridge, are paintings that seem to record early European sailors. Who they are, no one can say. But the Dutch navigator, Abel Tasman, did map the Kimberley coast in 1644. These figures appear to be dressed in some type of uniform with huge hats. They're smoking European-style pipes and carrying baskets. Crocodiles prefer muddy, secluded rivers, but here in the isolation of the Kimberley, they frequent the rocky bays and sandy beaches. This young salty is about three years old. By the time True North reaches the Mitchell River, the weather's cloudy and oppressive. And Barramundi are really on the bite. Just at the turn of the tide is the best time to fish. And Jan's ecstatic. Her husband Trevor has hooked a barra. Malcolm's never far from the action when Barramundi are biting. That's a very nice fish. The midday meal is a picnic delivered by helicopter.
A Merton's water monitor strolls past, totally unconcerned by all the activity. A broad, flat rock allows everyone to board the chopper easily and fly inland to marvel at the spectacular Mitchell Falls. In the dry season, these falls can be reached by four-wheel drive vehicle and a long hike. But it's now the beginning of April, and the Kimberley roads are still closed to all traffic. In the Jet Ranger, the two north passengers can reach the top of the escarpment to explore one of the great Kimberley waterfalls. There's a constant helicopter shuttle all afternoon so that everyone can experience the rugged beauty of the Mitchell Gorge. Before True North leaves, Trevor and Jan go fishing again. And small barracuda provide plenty of action. Jan's still determined to catch that big barramundi and this time, she's convinced she's hooked one. Oh, he's, oh, he's oh. gone. He's broken me right off. What was it? <laughs> oh, that rotten. Look, my lord, everything's just gone. <laughs> what was it? I didn't even see what it was. <laughs> Jan's disappointed, so Malcolm runs the dinghy close to the shore and she catches some magnificent mangrove jack. The morning breaks cool and cloudy and steady rain begins to fall. This makes for a pleasant walk to a World War II plane wreck. With the imminent Japanese invasion of Dutch New Guinea, the DC-3 left Perth to evacuate civilians. It overshot Broome, ran out of fuel, and crash landed on the coast. Malcolm spotted the wreck years ago and it's now an attraction for passing boats. The Kimberley is truly a photographer's paradise. Everywhere are colorful picture postcard shots. On a small island, a group of Bradshaw paintings can be seen. These delicate figures were named after an early explorer, Joseph Bradshaw, who first discovered this unique rock art on the mainland. The origin of Bradshaw paintings remains a mystery, although some researchers claim that they're at least 20,000 years old. After an overnight run, True North anchors in the deep waters of King George's River. With so much rain from the recent cyclone, the river's in flood. Few people ever see this dramatic display in the most isolated corner of northwest Australia. And the best way to appreciate the power and magnitude of the falls? High above in a helicopter.
Within a few months, the river will stop flowing. But now in full flood, it's an awesome spectacle. Below the falls, in calmer water, thick foam swirls into huge abstract patterns. Reluctantly, they leave the King George and begin the long journey down to Wyndham. Near the mouth of the river lies a magic place, a cliff-lined inlet, with its dramatic backdrop of delicate waterfalls. From the King George, it's a few hours' run to the Berkeley River, where True North anchors for the night. At sunup, Malcolm's out in the dinghy with Trevor and Jan. Jan's still after that elusive barramundi. But within minutes, it's Trevor who's hooked something big. Half an hour later, Trev's still trying to land his fish, and Jan's beginning to feel the strain. It's a huge queen oh, fish. A few snapshots, and it's released. <laughs> On the rising tide, they motor into the Berkeley Gorge, the most colourful of the entire Kimberley coast. Thank <laughs> you. 
Leaving True North and the dinghies for the last time, they enter a small side creek leading into a magnificent chasm. At the end is a high waterfall, and for a few minutes, everyone's captivated by its grandeur. Thirty kilometres inland, the wet season runoff pours over the escarpment. Not the best conditions for fishing, but a few barramundi are taking the lures. How's that for a Kimberley Barramundi? Caught on the true north. Last day just before we go into Wyndham. What a magnificent fish. Oh. The following morning, the journey's over, and True North ties up at the Wyndham Wharf. Great to have you. And that really was a wonderful trip on the True North, and that's the way to see the Kimberleys beyond 2000. The True North trips have been so successful, the company has now invested in a new state-of-the-art Bell helicopter to make the Kimberley experience even more enjoyable. <laughs>